Okay, good morning and welcome to the first meeting in 2014 of the Finance Committee of the Scottish Parliament. I'd like to wish everyone a happy uh, new year. Can I please remind everyone present to turn off any mobile phones, tablets or other electronic devices? And we have received uh, apologies from Jamie Hepburn, who is unwell, and he's being replaced today by Dave Thompson. So I'd like to welcome Dave back to the committee. The first item on our agenda today is to decide whether to consider the draft report on our, uh, on our inquiry into proposals for an independent fiscal body in private at future meetings. Are members agreed? Members have indicated their agreement. Our second item of business today is to take oral evidence as part of an inquiry into proposals for an independent fiscal body from Caroline Gardner, Auditor General for Scotland, and Russell Frith, Assistant Auditor General. And I'd like to warmly welcome you both to uh, today's meeting. I believe that our witnesses do not uh, wish to make an opening statement, so we shall go straight to questions from the committee. And obviously you're veterans of the committee, you know the, the, the routine, so I'll ask a few opening questions and uh, then we'll move on to uh, colleagues around the table who will then ask their own questions. Uh, first I'd like to say uh, I think it's a, an excellent submission, very clear, very concise and straightforward. Um, so the first question I'd like to ask is in, in reference to paragraph 4 you state that, and I quote, it will be important to ensure that the proposed body has a critical mass of work to enable it to attract suitably talented and experienced people. This may influence the structure for the new body, for example using part-time experts from a wide range of backgrounds rather than only a small full-time expert cadre in order to achieve the range of, range of skills required at a proportionate cost. I therefore um, like to ask, first of all, what would Audit Scotland prefer, um, a, a full-time uh, expert group or um, a, a part-time experts from a wide range of, of backgrounds? What, in your view, would be the most appropriate? And could you also tell us what you feel a proportionate cost might be? We'll do our best, convener. Um, I think the, the appropriate size of the body obviously would depend on the role and remit that's agreed for it. Um, and I know that in the evidence you've heard from other witnesses over the last few weeks, um, you've been focusing on the different potential uh, roles for the body, whether it's responsible for producing the government's forecasts on which its own budgeting and tax proposals are uh, based, or for commenting on forecasts that are made by government. Um, both of those would bring with them different requirements for the skills that are involved and for the, the sort of scale of the resources, the number of people, the extent to which they needed to be full-time or could be um, a, a council of advisers who had other roles. Um, there is obviously a challenge uh, for us in Scotland in a number of ways as we're setting up new bodies to reflect the growing fiscal autonomy we've got under the Scotland Act and with whatever happens next September and thereafter to make sure that we've both got the capacity to do uh, the things that are needed, all the new things that will be needed, and that that's done at a proportionate cost in any case, but particularly at a time of the economic challenges we're all facing. Um, so I think the, the reason for us making that point is uh, to encourage the committee and indeed the government to be thinking very clearly about the purpose of the body and then to make sure that it can be put together in a way where the range of skills that are required can be uh, brought together at a, a senior and credible enough level to, to really fulfil the full remit of the body, to build that authority and credibility, which is a key part of its purpose, and to do that in a way which fits with the other new institutions that will be required as Scotland heads into this new era. Well, we'll obviously try and pin down the Cabinet Secretary when he, he comes in after you on some of these points, but I'm just wondering what side you would kind of, you've managed to dodge the question a wee bit by not saying what kind of side you would come down on. Um, I mean, obviously we, we don't know exactly what the full remit would be at this point, but what, what do you feel um, instinctively would be the most appropriate, you know, a small group or a, a wide range? If the body is involved in producing forecasts, then um, in a sense it will have to have a core of uh, full-time permanent analytical staff from a range of economic and um, other financial backgrounds to be able to do that. Um, being able to do that in a way which keeps those people uh, gainfully employed across the year probably means that they would need to be looking at a wider range of issues than simply the annual forecast to go into the budget setting process. If, on the other hand, they were commenting on the government's fiscal strategy and its own proposals, it could be much smaller and could potentially be uh, people who are working on a part-time basis and combining that with other roles. Numbers... 
And have you any ballpark figure in terms of proportionate costs? You know, I mean, what sort of sums are we talking about? Because we, we've actually given evidence on a, on the kind of costs uh, um, in terms of other um, jurisdictions. Uh, so I'm just wondering if you've given any thought to that. What do you think would be a maximum or a minimum, for example? I think it's too soon to be specific about them, but I, I do know the evidence you've seen gives you a range of options, um, some of which are for countries of a similar size and scale to Scotland, so it can be done. I think we're just highlighting the importance of getting that balance right. Yeah, now, now, in paragraph 7, you say that the, um, the chair and two of the other four members of the UK Office of Budget Responsibility, uh, the OBR, of course, are appointed by the Chancellor of the Exchequer with the consent of the Treasury Committee of the House of Commons. Are you suggesting that the Scottish Government should appoint with the consent of the Finance Committee? Not necessarily at all. I think that that's in the context of an answer from us saying that, depending again on the remit of the um, independent financial body, um, the Government may have a stake in the uh, appointment of those senior people. I think the starting point, to be clear, if it's going to be an independent body, it has to have a very clear accountability to Parliament. That's how you get the benefits of separating the function from being done in government. It has to have that line to Parliament to achieve that benefit in the first place. But if, as in the case of the OBR, one of the core roles of the body is to prepare the forecast, it's also entirely appropriate that there's a, there's a close line of accountability to government as well. Um, it's very hard to see how government could have confidence in those forecasts without that close relationship and the confidence of the um, senior finance people in government in the new body. Um, on the other hand, if it were doing something uh, which was much more separate in terms of commenting on the government's forecast, that line of accountability to government, to government is less important. But I think the line to the parliament is unarguable in terms of uh, delivering the independence, which is the, the main purpose of creating such a body. Okay, thank you. Now, in paragraph 12, you state that, uh, I quote, possible additional objectives could include providing economic reports for Scotland where existing UK information is not disaggregated or where there is good reason in the view of the IFB to use different assumptions. Can you provide um, uh, an example or two? I think there's a couple of broad examples, and I'll ask Russell Frith to come in in a moment. The first is what we already see in relation to the new Scottish taxes, especially the landfill tax and the land and building transactions tax, which are significant in the context of the Scottish Government's budget, but very small in the context of, context of the UK budget. And I think given the OBR's current remit, it's entirely understandable that they would not expect to be putting the same effort into developing the information needed to develop more sensitive, more fine-grained forecasts of things which are small in that context for them, but significant for Scotland. The other area where I think that there might be real value in that is where the Scottish Government is looking to explore um, different taxation strategies as its financial powers devolve, um, or where there is a genuine difference of view, as we've seen to an extent already, about the, the different weight of the factors that might affect forecasts in future. And I think it's entirely appropriate that the Scottish Government and the Scottish Parliament has an interest in uh, the uh, body setting up the forecasts in the way that's being proposed for the future. Russell may want to add to that. Thanks, Guy. I think the yeah, Auditor General is absolutely right. It, there, there are areas where uh, a body such as an IFB, if it was preparing economic forecasts, could fill in, help to fill in gaps where information is not generally currently available at a disaggregated level for, for Scotland as opposed to the UK as a whole. Some of that would be around sort of benefits areas. Um, Ta all taxation areas where the impact of things in Scotland may be proportionately very different from how they appear across the, the UK as a whole. And if you're getting into economic forecasting, then it's fairly essential for such a body to have access to information that currently isn't necessarily available freely within, within Scotland, particularly around the, the benefit side. Okay. So, just one final question, um, then I'll open the session out to colleagues uh, around the table. Um, in terms of um, you know, uh, quality, you say that uh, the body should have a commitment to quality, including external evaluation of its work. Um, I wonder uh, who you believe is best suited to that role, or Scotland perhaps? 
I don't think so, actually, Pavina. It's a very good question and one which is relevant to us as an audit body as well. Um, I'll use that as a parallel first, if I may, and then come back to the new forecasting body. Um, for public audit, there's already a suite of international auditing standards that, that we adhere to, um, and we have a range of peer reviews in place already to um, both help us learn where we can improve, but also provide that external assurance to you and other stakeholders that that's what we're doing. So we appoint ICAS to review our in-house audit practice. We rely on the Financial Reporting Council's quality review team for the firms who do about a third of our work, and we engage in peer reviews with the National Audit Office, the Wales Audit Office, and the Northern an island audit office for our performance audit work because they are the peers who can take that informed view that we're complying with standards and identify areas where we may want to think about improvements. For um, the independent fiscal body, we certainly wouldn't be in a position to do that. We're not economists, we're not forecasters. Um, but I think there is a, a strong and growing tradition among um, budget bodies like that globally, and we heard some of that through the OECD's evidence to you uh, in, in 2013, that those sorts of peer reviews can provide the same sort of challenge and assurance to those who rely on the forecast that they are being prepared in line with the right professional standards and that they're continuing to improve. Okay, well, thank you very much. I'm now going to open out the session, and the first person to ask questions will be Deputy Convener, John, to be followed by Malcolm. Uh, thanks, Convener. Um, I mean, I think probably expanding or touching on some of the same points that have already been uh, mentioned. The, the whole question about you know attracting the right people uh, to be part of the the body, and you, you use the term critical mass of work a couple of times. Um, I mean, do you think we are going to have problems attracting people because this will be perceived as being quite small scale compared to something like the OBR? I wouldn't say necessarily because of the scale itself. Um, I think we all feel that this is an exciting time in Scotland and it's always exciting to be involved in setting up a new function like this, doing something new which will contribute towards uh, the um, financial sustainability of the government's new fiscal powers. That's a professional challenge for any economist, I'd have thought. Um, but there are challenges, as we know from setting up Audit Scotland, about putting in place a body which is both proportionate in terms of the cost, but also can attract people of the right numbers and seniority to do work of the quality and calibre that's required, to put in place career paths, and to think about where those people might move on to um, in a Scottish context. None of those is insurmountable, but it feels to us that now's the time to be thinking about it, particularly again, given the importance of independence from government here. Um, there may be a role for secondments from the civil service to some roles within the new body, um, but I think to rely on that uh, and nothing else would uh, limit some of the benefits of, of independence, which are, again, the purpose of putting this body in place. We, we, I think we had one suggestion that, you know, to start with, if we're only looking at um, land and buildings transaction tax and landfill tax, we maybe don't even need a completely separate body. It could be kind of attached to something else. Um, but the other suggestion was, well, we start with something small and then presumably it would grow over time if we have more taxes that we're responsible for. It's a judgment call, clearly, for those two, fact, those two taxes um, and increasingly Scottish rate of income tax as it comes into on stream. We will need a forecasting function in Scotland that we haven't needed before. And the more fiscal autonomy there is, the more important that forecasting becomes and, and to a great extent, the more important the reassurance that comes from independence is. On balance, I think our view is that it does make sense to start with something now that could be built upon in the event of more fiscal autonomy more fiscal devolution if that's what happens in future, um, but to make sure that the core of it now is proportionate and provides a good basis for growth in future. And kind of linked in with that, there was the suggestion from some other countries, I think, that you know, there's not that many experts out there to be on the board. If you change them too often, you, you kind of, well, the danger is you run out of experts, eh, whereas the danger, I suppose, of having people on for too long is they become familiar with the relationships and it becomes too close. Have you any thoughts on that regard? I, I think in terms of um, the independence criterion, which is one that we stress heavily in our submission, um, it is important that people um, move on after a period of time. And again, to take a parallel, my term of office is eight years. After that, I can't be reappointed. And the aim is to make sure that whoever is fulfilling the role of Auditor General is coming to it fresh, has long enough to do the job well, but also doesn't become so um, embedded in the system that they, they lose that bit of distance and the sort of grit in the mill that is part of the purpose of the post. 
Um, again, it's a judgment call for exactly what it should be, but I think something which both gives people long enough to get their feet under the table, get to understand the complexities of a very complex area, but also ensures there's a regular turnover, whether that's of senior members of staff or of um, council members, if that's the sort of model that's put in place, is very important for independence purposes. I think Russell wants to add to that. Just, just to, add, to add to that, one of the ways in which you can mitigate the... the the consequences of people either being too familiar or rapid turnover is to make sure that there is partial turnover of the body in reasonably frequent terms so that you're not turning over the whole membership at any one time. So that's fair. Um, I mean, the reference was made again in paragraph 7 that the chair and two of the other four members of the OBR are appointed by the Chancellor with the consent of the Treasury Committee. I mean, that's like three out of five. Um, because the other model we had suggested to us was that really it should be the minimum number of people that are chaired by the, or sorry, appointed by government oblique parliament. And then the chair or whatever has autonomy to recruit the people they want, bring on board the people they want, which on the surface would maybe give them a bit more independence. Any thoughts on that? Yes, I think that principle is absolutely right in terms of carrying out the work. My understanding is that in the OBR, the Budgetary, budgetary Responsibility Committee members are the three who were appointed um, with that uh, focus of doing the forecasting work. The other two members of the OBR are appointed to the Oversight Committee, effectively, which is part of the governance arrangements, making sure that the use of resources is done properly, but also that the... Um, uh, the arrangements for ensuring the quality of the work are up to scratch. There's a parallel there in our board in Audit Scotland in that I'm appointed by um, the Queen on the recommendation of the Parliament. Um, the Chair of the Accounts Commission is appointed by Scottish Ministers. But then there's a committee of this Parliament, the SCPA, which appoints the other three non-exec members of our board. They have no involvement in our audit work, but they are there to make sure that we are living up to the standards we expect of others in terms of both our use of resources and the quality of arrangements we've got in place. So I, I think you're right. I think there's real merit in having the smallest number of people appointed by either Parliament or Government and being accountable to Parliament for that work and giving them freedom then to um, appoint their own uh, staffing or other resources to carry out the work in line with their professional judgment, but accountable for that in some proper way that gives you oversight that public money is being used well. Okay, thanks. And I think finally... Um on the question of data being available at a Scottish level, I mean, is the fundamental problem that the data just is not available at a Scottish level, because it's all in one pool, or that it is available somewhere, but nobody's able to, or people like yourselves or this, the, the new group, eh, are having difficulty finding it? A bit of a mix. Um, some of the data is data which probably is available in different data sets, but hasn't been used for these purposes before. And I think you heard a flavour of that from David Bell before Christmas, um, with new models they're developing, which is using data from different sources to answer new questions that haven't really mattered in the past until we've had these new fiscal powers to use. Other data simply isn't available, and probably the best example of that is the identification of Scottish taxpayers, um, which simply hasn't been required by anybody in the past. HMRC is going through a process now of starting to label us all with the S that will show that we're Scottish taxpayers, but it, it simply hasn't existed previously. So one of the, the purposes, I think, of the, one of the main functions of the new body, however it's set up, will be to think about what questions it will need to answer, what data it will need to do that, and either to identify where it can be drawn from or to start the processes of um, developing it and capturing it for the future, which is another reason, I think, for starting with something that can be built on as uh, fiscal autonomy grows in future. So that would suggest it could take some time really to get the whole thing up and running properly? I, I think it almost certainly will, yes. um, not only because of the availability of data, but also the uh, quality and complexity of the models that will need to be developed and the expertise of the people doing it. All of those are things that don't happen overnight. Thanks very much. OK, uh, Malcolm to be followed by Michael. And you said you weren't economists or forecasters, but obviously you do have a strong focus on public finance. So I wonder how you see the relationship between the new body and yourselves. 
Um, I, I think we do have different roles with an element of um, interaction between us. Um, our focus is clearly on decisions about public money which have already been taken. Um, we're very keen to um, make sure that the government is not only accounting for money that has been spent properly um, in the past, but that government and all public bodies are also exercising good strategic financial management in making decisions about the future. But primarily our focus is on was this decision taken properly and is it being implemented in a way that offers value for money and protects public money? The um, independent forecasting body will be um, responsible, on the other hand, for looking ahead to inform decisions that will be taken in future. There's a, a shared interest in financial sustainability around the interests of that are, the decisions that have already been taken, and I'd expect we would stay in close touch with a new body um, where it's set up, uh, but I think our roles would be quite distinct in that sense. Some overlap. I mean, you're obviously very interested in assets and liabilities, for example, so presumably there would be a bit of overlap. I think, I think there would, but again, the way in which that interest would be expressed would be different. Um, so we briefed you before Christmas on a report that we produced about developing financial reporting in this new context, in which we'd identified the importance of having a comprehensive picture of Scotland's public finances, including the assets and liabilities, future commitments for um, revenue financing of capital investment, those sorts of things. Having that information available would be a very important starting point for the new forecasting body to be able to build on, but we wouldn't be falling over each other to um, make sure that the, the data was there. We'd have clear roles that were separate about it. In terms of the independence of the new body, I mean, I think as far as I know, you've got a very good reputation for independence. So are, are there lessons to be learned from that? I mean, you described the appointment process. I mean, although you're not necessarily saying it ought to be the same for the new body, but do you think there are any general lessons from your experience in terms of how to ensure an independence? Um, yes, I think I'd pull out two things. First of all, um, you've seen in the OECD principles a number of um, mechanisms which are intended to protect that independence. I think those formal things are all very important and are worth um, getting right in the early stages of a new body. Um, I think that's been uh, reinforced by all the evidence that you've heard. Um, but a number of witnesses have also said that the authority and credibility of the new body is just as important, and I'd concur with that. I think the way that any new body conducts itself, the perception of independence and um, the ways in which it's operated in practice really help to build that sense of being a voice which is worth listening to, not just one that's protected in statute. And the second point I draw out is that um, the, the time to get those arrangements um, right and in place is early on and that they need to be flexible to respond to situations that we may not have foreseen yet. Um, we, you've heard a number of examples of where that independence has been challenged for very understandable reasons. Politics is a rough game, we know it is, and um, politicians on all sides of a debate will be looking both to use things that the new body says for their own um, purposes and to challenge things which, um, they, which uh, don't agree with their own objectives and to um, make sure that the body um, has got in place the, the right protections for its independence that can be um, that, that will withstand that sort of challenge and will withstand different political contexts in future, whether that's minority government, coalition, uh, majority government, uh, more fragmentation, I think is an important thing to think through at this stage. I mean, you've helpfully described some of the possible options for the role and remit of the body, and there's no reason why you should uh, you know, come down and one side or another or however many sides there are to that discussion but I mean one helpful distinction you made was that you were saying you know if it was producing forecasts as far as I remember it would be a large group particularly at that time when they were doing that but they might have to uh, find other things to do for the rest of the year whether if it was commenting it would be a smaller group I mean I suppose I mean I suppose I am coming down to think that it, that it would need to be producing forecasts as its core task so you know assuming that model I mean, what, what other activities do you think, or perhaps this is asking you to express a view that you don't want to express, but what would you see as potential add-ons to that core role uh, that it has? I mean, an interesting one that you mentioned in your paper was costing major legislative proposals. I mean, that seems to me to be a very worthwhile thing. Do we spend a lot of our time in this committee looking at financial memorandums, and it's, it's probably one of the areas where we, we probably... Um, across parties have the most criticism of, of the Scottish uh, government in the broad sense. So, I, I, I mean, that would seem to me to be what one 
one good suggestion, but I, I wondered whether you did have a view about what other activities you think would be most appropriate for the body over and above its forecasting role. I need to start off by saying I think it's genuinely a policy question and therefore one for government and the parliament rather than for us. Um, I think there's a, an in, inherent tension that you can't avoid between a narrow remit which helps to keep the um, forecasting body out of the political arena and therefore helps to protect its independence and the perception of its independence and a wider remit which may well tap into the expertise and the perspective it's got but means it will in inevitably get caught up in um, more of the political day-to-day um, -day knockabout that goes on. Um, you're right that uh, costing um, policy proposals is something that would fit very well with the skill set of a new body and could help to smooth the workload of a body that needed the resources to do the forecast each year, but I think it would inevitably increase its involvement in the political debate that was going on, and that's a trade-off which has to be a policy choice. I and think it's... A helpful way of putting it. So basically you're saying the wider its role is the more controversial it gets. I mean, again, from your own experience, are there, are there certain aspects of your activity that actually has, has led you into more dangerous waters in terms of uh, neutrality and so on? It's a very good question. The legislation which establishes the role of Auditor General very clearly prohibits me from commenting on the merits of policy, and I think that's a good thing. Having said that, I don't think you can ever draw a clear black line between commenting on the merits of policy and commenting on the implementation of policy. Um, so in the 18 months that I've been, on off, been in office, we've commented on a number of significant government policies um, where some things have gone very well and some things have got room for improvement. Um, and there, there's been a lot of political interest in both the, um, the praise, the commendation and the criticism that we've given. I would argue very strongly we haven't commented on the merits of policy, but it, it isn't a, a, a line which keeps you out of politics, even if you stick very strictly by that rule. OK, thanks. That's very helpful. Michael, to be followed by Jean. Thanks, <coughs> uh, This question is not uh, unrelated to the one that, that Malcolm uh, was, was pursuing there, but it's, it's one of the issues that's come up from other evidence that we've taken in relation to this. It's about you know, the... the the body not just being a predictor or an analyst, but actually suggesting uh, policy. Uh, there are some independent financial bodies in other uh, jurisdictions which actually suggest to government what policies it might pursue. Um, do you have any concerns over that in, in the context of what's being proposed uh, for Scotland? I, I think I need to come back to, to the sort of tension which is um, a, a key judgment that needs to be made here between a body which is um, very narrowly focused on financial sustainability and commenting on government policy, which helps to keep it out of the politics, um, but also limits the value you can get from the investment you're making, and something which moves along that spectrum of pr making proposals rather than just commenting. Um, it is a trade-off, there's no question about it. My sense is that the countries where bodies have been able to make alternative proposals and to do that in a way which hasn't compromised their independence or the perception of it are the ones where the body has been um, established for longer and perhaps where there's a different political culture. I think you had a flavour of that from the Swedish body before Christmas as well. Um, so my personal sense is that probably a slightly narrower remit to start with at least would be a better contribution to the decisions that will need to be made for the Scotland Act implementation and with whatever happens thereafter. But there, there are clearly benefits in being able to tap into that sort of expertise to think about wider questions like the merits of policy, alternative proposals, manifesto commitments, which has also been raised to the potential role for the OBR in, in the UK. To the outset. It's a policy call, and I really don't want to go much further than that, but I think there probably are some advantages to a narrower remit, at least in the early stages. Okay. Thanks, Kavina. Um, Jean, to be followed by Gavin. <coughs> Thank you, Kavina. Um, I wanted to, to ask your opinion about the National Performance Framework, which, given that Scotland uh, is the only country amongst the, uh, and other jurisdictions who have commented, that hasn't really... Uh, been taken into consideration at any point, but it seems to me that it does have a role and evidence that we've taken about the MPF has been very positive that it was it's a good thing um, We want to know how to you know spread the word about that, but do you see that 
um, the any advisory body or um, observations would take into account, I guess, the outcomes of, of policy as well as uh, financial outcomes or budgetary uh, implications. I'll start by saying I, I fully agree that the National Performance Framework is a, a good development. I think it's really good for any government to be as clear as that about what its objectives are, how they link together and how progress will be measured. Um, and it's a, it's a first step. What I'd like to see developing over time is more of a link between the objectives in the national framework and the way in which public money is used, um, both in terms of the way the government reports progress against the framework, how much it's cost to achieve different um, improvements in the objectives, um, the way it's informing proposals for resource allocation, for investing in one area and disinvesting in another. Um, and by um, extension from that, I think it would make perfect sense for the independent fiscal body to be able to take into account the links between the government's forecasts and the objectives it set through the national performance framework as well. It's not to say that's easy. It's, it's an ambitious thing to do. And as you said, it's unusual in the world to see governments committing themselves in that way to do it. But I think that would be a very positive direction of travel for the future. And... Um Further, just to uh, the comment that, uh, that you suggest that the Scottish body could be required to cooperate with the equivalent UK body, um, but what, what kind of comparisons would be made if, if our policies were, as they are in some cases, quite different? I mean, would you be limiting that, or would that be a restriction on, on the kind of comparisons that can be made? I think that there are two strands to the answer. While um, Scotland has still got links with the rest of the UK, and I phrase that carefully because none of us knows where the journey we're currently on will end, there will be areas of common interest between a Scottish forecasting body and the OBR. And I think it's in no one's interest for those um, the forecasts they produce to be divergent for reasons that aren't well understood. So at the very least, I think there would need to be transparency about the way in which they've reached their forecasts of areas of common interest. And ideally, if there were consensus as well, that would strengthen your decision making. The more... Um, Scotland's finances are independent of those of the rest of the UK, the fewer those areas are likely to be. But there probably is still a benefit in sharing expertise, um, sharing information, uh, learning from each other in the way that we currently do with our colleagues in the National Audit Office and in Wales and so on. A similar professional network, I think, can help to build that capacity um, that we, we started off with here in Scotland um, and to make sure we're getting the most from the investment that we're making in it. And finally, just the, the time frame that we have, the Cabinet Secretary has said that he would like to see this body in place by 2015. Um, and if we accept your own uh, advice that, that we should start with you know, a, a smaller body um, in, the, in the beginning and keeping it simple almost, would you see the importance of that being actually getting the remit that you might want to end up with in the first instance and having part of that being activated or, or would you see a remit that would change as time went on? I very much expect it to change as time goes on. I think um, the two key things for me would be, first of all, making sure that what you've got is flexible and can evolve in the face of different circumstances and a different environment here in Scotland. And secondly, that whatever's put in place as a starting point is transparent. Um, those forecasts will need to be made for the land and buildings transaction tax, the landfill tax, Scottish rate of income tax. It's important that whatever forecasts we have there are as transparent as they can be for the same reasons that we will eventually... Um, aim to have an independent body doing that and increasing transparency in a different way. Thank you. Thank you, Jean. Uh, Gavin. Thank you. Um, good morning. You, you say in uh, paragraph 10 of your uh, submission um, that in accordance with the OECD principles, the body should have access to all the information held by government that it needs for its work. Obviously a, a sensible suggestion. Do you think that should be covered, and, and particularly from your own experience in Audit Scotland, does that need to be st a statutory right to all information, or should the body have a sort of memorandum of understanding with each 
government department or area. I just wonder if you can sort of outline how, how it works for Audit Scotland and if you have any views on how it ought to work um, for a fiscal body. I think it should be enshrined in statute. Um, I think it's important both symbolically and to strengthen the position of the body um, in um, carrying out its work, again, as that work evolves in future. I don't think statute can or should, though, contain the detail of what that information means. And I think there is a role for a memorandum of understanding or other um, ways of working that help to um, develop that in future. Um, I know you heard in some of your evidence sessions about some of the tensions that can come into play there, particularly when the politics get more fraught. Um, so having it enshrined in legislation is a very important starting point, but the legislation can never cover all the nuances or all the types of information that might be required over time. So you, have the, you have the broad principle in legislation, but the, the detail you, you, you work out Elsewhere. later. And is, is that roughly how it works with your own organisation? It is indeed. Yes. My, my right of access to, to information is enshrined in the Scotland Act um, and the Public Finance and Accountability Act. Um, and we then have the Scottish Public Finance Manual, which sets out the way in which we carry out our work with government and other bodies. Thank you. Um, secondly, the, the convener asked about external evaluation and you sort of pointed out really how your own organisation deals with that, mentioning ICAS among, among other bodies. For, from your point of view, is, is, that, is that something that is statutory that you have to do or is that a sort of choice taken by Audit Scotland to, to boost credibility and just to sort of, you know, because it's the right thing to do? What, what's the sort of mix? It's not statutory, um, but it, it does follow um, from the accounting and auditing standards that we're required to follow. Even if it didn't, we would want to do as much of that as we can because that um, credibility is very important to us as well. Um, Russell's responsible for that area of our work, so I'll ask him to take you through the way in which it's built up over time and how we report it. And I think one, one of the other factors for us is that our equivalent organisations in the private sector auditing private companies are under a, a pretty much a statutory framework which does require oversight and regulation and therefore we believe it is good practice that we should be subject to the same standards as we would be if we were operating in, in, in the private sector. So as, as the Auditor General has already said, we have various forms of, of peer review of the different parts of our, our work, some done by ICAS, some done by the, the, the other audit agencies. Thank you. And finally, just one very narrow question, just on the, again, it's been raised, the idea of, of costing major uh, legislative proposals. Um, highly specific question, but did, did you have in mind um, that, that the new body would do the official memorandum, if you are, the official financial memorandum, or would it more be a case of the body would comment on the financial memorandum? We're not proposing either. Sure, We're okay. saying that's something which could be a part of the okay. forecasting body's remit um, and which, which could help with this, the scale question. Um, but it would have a downside in terms of bringing it closer into the political arena. Sure, yeah. um, it clearly would be an option for the body to be producing the policy and financial memoranda, the financial memorandum part of that. Um, but I think that would bring it very close um, to the government's policy development area and probably would um, be quite a big step in terms of bringing it closer to government and therefore limiting its independence. Thank you. That's good. That's all. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And that has concluded questions from the committee. I'm just wondering if there's any further points you would wish to bring forward at this point. And thanks for the convenience. Thank you for the chance to talk to you this morning. Okay, well, thank you very much for your uh, answers uh, to committee. I'm now going to suspend the session um, to allow a changeover of witnesses.
Okay, I shall uh, reconvene the session. Uh, moving to the final evidence session of our inquiry into proposals for an independent fiscal body, I welcome to the meeting the Cabinet Secretary for Finance, Employment and Sustainable Growth. Mr Swinney is accompanied by Alistair Brown and Dr Graham Roy, both from the Scottish Government. I'd like to wish you a very happy uh, New Year to all of you. Uh, I'd like to invite the Cabinet Secretary to make a brief opening statement. Uh, thank you, Convener, and, and uh, Happy New Year to, to you and to members of the committee. I welcome the opportunity to give evidence this morning to the committee's inquiry into proposals for an independent fiscal body to support the exercise of tax powers devolved by the Scotland Act 2012. Um, as the committee will be aware, I have already stated uh, to the committee my intention to create such a body. Um, I very much welcome the committee's interest in this issue and the considered evidence provided to this inquiry to date through written and oral evidence submissions from a range of experts and interested parties. The inquiry evidence has been considered carefully by the Scottish Government as we develop our proposals to create an independent fiscal commission. I have yet to take final decisions on the structure and functions of a new Scottish fiscal commission. These decisions will be taken and made public once I have had the opportunity to consider the findings of this inquiry. There is now widespread international recognition of the key role which independent fiscal commissions fulfil within the overall fiscal framework supporting an economy. Effective commissions can strengthen the fiscal credibility of forecasts produced by the government, produce, uh, provide a source of economic discipline and demonstrate fiscal competence. The Fiscal Commission Working Group pr produced a report on fiscal rules and fiscal commissions in November last year. The Fiscal Commission Working Group recommended that an independent Scottish Fiscal Commission should form part of the fiscal framework of an independent Scotland. The group also recommended that the Scottish Government should establish an independent Scottish Fiscal Commission in preparation for the transfer of tax powers under the Scotland Act 2012. I welcome this recommendation, which supports my intention to establish such an independent commission to enhance the credibility of revenue forecasts for the devolved taxes. It is nevertheless important that we maintain a sense of proportion as we discuss proposals for a fiscal commission. The commission, when first established, will have a remit which is proportionate to the powers devolved by the Scotland Act. This will ensure that the committee provides the appropriate level of assurance to Parliament and the public and remains cost-effective in its operation. It is also important in maintaining that sense of proportion that the fiscal commission uh, addresses or fits into the existing landscape of financial scrutiny, which is already provided for by the arrangements of the Scotland Act 1998, the public finance and accountability legislation, and principally the role of Parliament, uh, the role of this committee, uh, and also the role of other bodies that are set up for the purposes of exercising financial scrutiny, whether that's Audit Scotland, the Accounts Commission, or even the Financial Scrutiny Unit um, established within this Parliament. This Parliament does not yet have full uh, fiscal powers, and so it would not be appropriate to announce at this time plans to establish a commission on the scale of those which fully support independent countries. The outcome of the referendum will be a key milestone in the development of a Scottish Fiscal Commission. It will be a point at which we take stock of the functions, remit and size of the new Commission and start the process of placing the Commission on a statutory footing. The expanded Scottish Fiscal Commission, which, would establish, which we would establish on independence, would be a continuation of, not a replacement for, the Commission which is established this year to support the devolved taxes. In particular, I would expect the members of the Commission appointed this year to remain in place uh, to, throughout this journey. The final point which I wish to highlight in these opening remarks is that it will be critical to the effectiveness and credibility of a new Scottish Fiscal Commission that it is independent of government and it is seen to be so. The independence of a Scottish Fiscal Commission would be upheld by formal safeguards as well as the general conduct of the Commission and its members. Formal safeguards would include the appointment process, protection of financial resources available to the Commission and a formal public statement which clarifies and governs the relationship between the Commission and Scottish Ministers. It is my intention that this committee, as representative of the wider Parliament, Will, key, will play a key role in protecting the independence of the new Commission. Um, I'm pleased to have this opportunity to answer questions from the committee. Thank you very much for that opening and fairly comprehensive uh, statement. I think you've answered probably a lot of questions that members of the committee would want to ask, but of course when questions are answered they lead to, to other questions. And I appreciate you know, that um, you'll be taking decisions only once the inquiry is concluded, but of course the committee will try and tease out some answers uh, from you um, uh, over the next hour. 
or so um, to, to, to try and gauge uh, your thinking on this, Cabinet Secretary. I mean, if I could just uh, start uh, with a few questions in, in the usual fashion, I wonder if I could uh, touch on the bit that you kind of, um, just before you kind of close there, which is appointment accountability. You know, Audit Scotland were in uh, before you, of course, and they uh, link the methods of appointment accountability the achievement of the principles of independence and non-partisanship. And in the case of appointments to a Scottish body, uh, Audit Scotland said that there is a case for involving both the Parliament and Executive in the most significant appointments, such as the Chair and Senior profe uh, Professional. So I'm just wondering where the balance should be struck in terms of those appointments and what, how, what, what your feelings are in that particular issue at this time. I, I certainly come at this issue, Kavira, from the perspective that um, one of the um, central requirements of the Scottish Fiscal Commission is that it must be independent and it must be seen to be independent. So therefore, in the manner of the appointment process and in the style and duration of the appointments, um, I think it's important that there can be no question that um, any individuals involved in that process have either arrived at that process um, without um, due regard to the expertise that they can contribute to the process, um, to the experience that they have that could assist us in the task that's got to be undertaken, and that the approach and process that we've taken has satisfied um, wider scrutiny that an independent process has been undertaken. Um, uh, clearly, um, there is a role for, um, uh, for ministers in uh, an element of the process of appointment. Um, I clearly see a role for parliament in uh, an element of that process. Um, my views are not uh, fixed on, on how that should be turned into practical reality. Um, uh, I'm certainly very open to the involvement of this committee in considering how those appointments are made, um, uh, being involved in the appointments process. I've generally taken a a style of approach which has tried to um, maximise the degree to which the committee is involved in, in all aspects of um, the, the, the government's financial work. So um, I think there's undoubtedly a role for, uh, for government and uh, for parliament in that process. Um, one of the other observations I would make is that, uh, and this is, a, I'm slightly firmer on, in, in my view on this point than I am on the, on the first point you've mentioned, Kavira, and that's about um, duration of office and the nature of appointments that are made. Uh, I'm very firmly of the view that no individual should ever be reappointed to the Fiscal Commission, so therefore individuals should only serve one term. And um, the Auditor General made a, a point to you this morning um, that uh, she, for example, serves one single eight-year term and uh, is ineligible for reappointment. And I think that um, that is the type of approach that gives a very clear signal of um, essentially not being beholden to anybody because there is no worry about reappointment. Um, one of the other points, so it's, I'm, I'm not wedded to an eight-year term, but I certainly think single terms are the order of the day. Um, I think also that um, one of the other points the committee um, discussed with the Auditor General this morning, which I think is a fair point, is that there must be um, the rolling retention of expertise so that it's not sort of one team in, one team out, um, uh, because that clearly affects the, the credibility and inherent strength of the body. So um, having individuals initially appointed for different periods of time, but as single terms of office, I think is uh, perhaps the best way to proceed in, in that respect. Um, so the, the, it's a clear point I would leave with the committee is that I uh, am very firmly of the view that individuals should be appointed, uh, but for a single term only. Now, you said you were not wedded to eight years, which to me seems a, a, an odd time period. But one of the things that we've received in evidence uh, from a number of witnesses is the fact that uh, it would be good if the appointment period did not coincide with the electoral cycle. It, the only way to, to guarantee that that happens on a permanent basis, because obviously if you have a four or a six or a seven year or eight year period would be that um, would you have, for example, a five year, because that way it would guarantee that it never matches up with the electoral cycle. Is that a kind of time period you'd be thinking of? Or I, think, I, think that, I think that's, a, that's a, the order that, uh, you know, I, I think my thinking is somewhere between four to six years um, for a term in office. Um, I, I think I could probably be persuaded um, 
by six, it might be advantageous to have some members appointed for six years, some for five, so that we can deal with that point of rotation, so there's, there's retained skills and expertise within the Commission. But uh, I certainly accept the point, Convener, that um, the appointment process and timetable has to be um, entirely separate from the political cycle. Um, there is, you know, there is you know, if the body is to be independent, then it's got, frankly, no relevance to the political cycle whatsoever. Um, so it doesn't matter who the government is, that as long as we've got an expert fiscal commission, they can exercise that responsibility. And uh, I'm very open to um, exploring how we can best um, take forward uh, such an approach. And uh, the, the convener of such a body, do you feel that they should appoint the people who work for um, the Independent Fiscal Commission? Or should they appoint some of them? Uh, you know, where do you stand on that particular issue? In you know, because obviously the OBR is a mix of appointment and uh, then the OBR recruits their own kind of stuff. Where, where are you on that uh, kind of issue? I, I'm, I think this, this is a quite difficult area because there is the principle of independence, which I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely committed to in relation to the, uh, the substance and the perception of the Fiscal Commission. Um, but, but I do come back to one of the points that I made in my opening remarks to the committee, that the Commission has to sit within the existing firmament of financial structures. And principally amongst that, I think it has to take account of the role of Parliament. Uh, Parliament is the democratic decision-making body of Scotland. And therefore, um, I, I, I get a bit nervous about um, establishing a body which then has its ability to appoint its own members. I'm not sure that quite fits in to ensuring that between the government and parliament, as the, you know, the parliament is elected by the public, um, the government is essentially selected by, the, uh, by, by parliament by virtue of its election of the first minister and his ability then to appoint his ministers. Um, so I think I, I, I'm, I, I'm instinctively um, nervous about a situation where um, the OBR has, uh, sorry, the, the Scottish Fiscal Commission would have the ability, as the OBR has, to appoint its own members, because I don't think that takes due account of the democratic, uh, the, the nature of the democratic structures that we have in place in Scotland today. Okay. Now, one of the things that's come up in evidence, it, it, it came up obviously in terms of the Audit Scotland evidence, but also, uh, you know, um, David Bell and others have, have talked about this particular issue, is the amount of work that would be available to the group. Now, you talked in your opening statement about, uh, you know, effectively dealing with a fairly uh, uh, limited um, number of areas, at least initially. So, therefore, are you of the view that there should be a small uh, full-time core or should there, in fact, be perhaps a full-time uh, convener with a number of people from a variety of backgrounds that can be called upon, given that there may not be enough work, at least initially, to maintain a kind of a panel, a group of experts working full-time in this field? What's your view on that? The, the key approach that I have in my mind on this question, convener, is that we have to observe a sense of proportion about the establishment of the body. Um, the, the body, um, in terms of considering the, the remit and the role of the body, I'm very clear about this, that the body we're establishing is to provide a forecasting support in the forecasting process of the new taxes that have been devolved to the Scottish Parliament. That, that will be the core and substance of the remit that I would believe appropriate for a Scottish Fiscal Commission at this stage. And I, I, add the caveat that clearly if our financial responsibilities expand as a consequence of the referendum in September, then I would be looking at the body having a wider set of responsibilities. But, you know, as I see it, the body has responsibility to support the forecasting process in relation to um, land and buildings, transaction tax, landfill tax and the Scottish rate of income tax. Um, now, on the landfill tax and um, land and buildings transaction tax, that function becomes relevant um, very soon because we will be undertaking the, the, the forecasting of these taxes will be material for the setting of the 2015-16 budget, which will be um, coming to Parliament uh, in the autumn. 
And uh, so therefore, that's the core substantive piece of work that has to be undertaken by the Fiscal Commission in the short term. Um, that should therefore guide um, what structure and resources we put in place. Um, I certainly don't believe that um, that will require um, a, a particularly significant amount of resource to be allocated to that process. Um, it has to be done well, but we have to have a sense of proportion about what work has got to be done to, um, uh, to prepare for the introduction of those two taxes in 2015-16, and then the next step in that process, notwithstanding any changes that may arise from the referendum, um, the preparation for the uh, forecasting around the Scottish rate of income tax. Um, so uh, I think my, my sense is that we would be taking steps in the shorter term to establish um, a, uh, and to deploy limited resources to the establishment of the Fiscal Commission. But as powers and responsibilities expand, I could see that role expanding um, in uh, to a large extent in due course. That's quite interesting, I mean, because we've had a lot of ev evidence from a, a number of people actually who are saying that, you know, that, that you know, the, the body could do this, it could do that. I mean, you know, for example, Professor Bell suggested a possible rolling considerable distributional impacts of budgetary decisions, etc. Um, you, what you're basically saying is you want this very kind of fairly narrow focus, at least initially, and then perhaps as time progresses and capacity increases, the remit could possibly be enhanced, particularly uh, dependent on the result of the, of the referendum or further powers being devolved to Scotland. Is that well, there's, there's, there's two particular issues that uh, I'm, I'm, I'm addressing there, Kavina. One is about the, 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 the nature and the role of the the body um, that, um, that I, I could see has been required in the short term, and that is essentially to provide a forecasting capacity in relation to the taxes that have been devolved to the Scottish Parliament as a consequence of the Scotland Act 2012. And um, in that respect, um, I think the requirements and the role are um, are, are, are really quite easy to define as to what we need to be, what needs to be done to support that process. The second point I'm making is the is one of the other points that I made in my opening statement, that um, I don't want to see the establishment of a Scottish Fiscal Commission to be used as an excuse to intrude on the responsibilities of other bodies that are already in place in Scotland today to undertake particular functions. Um, and um, the, the, the necessity for us to have a fiscal commission here is to fulfil the first function I talked about there, which is to forecast the um, tax, um, uh, uh, forecast the, the likely tax receipts in relation to the taxes that will be devolved to us. And I think we have to be very careful in the steps that we take that we don't establish a body that essentially has the capacity uh, or the scope to intrude on properly established financial arrangements for scrutiny within Scotland, which I think are um, well established by statute um, and, um, and, and established by the processes and the operations of Parliament. Thank you. I mean, colleagues are, are wanted to come in, so I'm only going to ask you one, one further point at this stage. Um, but, um, in terms of forecasting, um, some of the witnesses have talked about gaps in data. Now, I take it in terms of the taxes that you're specifically talking about, the, the body focusing on, we have all the data that would be required for that, or we will have in, um, in order for the, for the, the, the body to, take, um, to make the forecasts accurate. And secondly, um, is one of the reasons that makes the Scottish Government feel reluctant to... <coughs> expand the remit of the body. I, 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 under, I hear what you're saying about intruding and stepping on toes of other organisations, but the, la the fact that we just don't have the, the data to be able to do that at this stage, in any case, is that is that uh, part of your thinking, no, or has that got no, nothing to do with your that's thinking? got nothing to do with my thinking. Okay. Be, uh, no, that's I think fine. We, that's we, just to clarify uh, that. I'm, I'm, I'm confident on the... Um, 
uh, on the, the taxes that are going to be devolved to us um, under the Scotland Act 2012, um, once the process that is being undertaken just now, in which we are participants with HMRC in the establishment of the, um, the, the Scottish taxpayer base, for example, in relation to the Scottish rate of income tax, um, that, will be, um, that will provide um, data which um, doesn't currently exist, and, and that's simply because we're, you know, that's been defined just now. So there are today there are certain gaps, but they will be they will be resolved by the taking forward of the programmes to implement these particular tax changes. Um, but uh, certainly none of my views are informed by a concern over the lack of data. Okay, that's interesting. And just uh, will the fiscal body carry out the forecasts or comment on forecasts carried out by the government? That's a, a point on which I have not come to a firm view. Um, I think there are, um, there are different models. The evidence that the committee has taken from the OECD suggests that the, um, the largest block of independent fiscal commissions that the OECD has surveyed um, tend to uh, assess the forecast that government produces. And um, I think from a... From a, um, from a a perspective of um, regularity of use of data and um, expertise in formulating um, views on the utilisation of that data, that is perhaps, I'm not, not surprised that's the largest number of cases because it suggests to me that the, um, it, it rather deals with my point that this is a, you know, there's a, a lot of um, a, regular work that is undertaken in financial analysis that will be take, undertaken within government for which you require external scrutiny. Um, obviously the OBR is one of the, um, um, the more limited number of cases where the OBR actually constructs the, um, the forecast themselves. But um, I think we've, um, you know, if that's done on the basis of secondment from Treasury into the OBR, I'm, you know, I, I think there's a, a, a a degree of scepticism that could be uh, developed as to how far removed from government that actually is in terms of the utilisation of the same models, the same data by the same civil servants. So, you know, I think I think for the sake of kind of clarity and uh, about uh, about the, the the nature of um, arrangements, it might be clearer and simpler to say the government will produce an estimate and the fiscal commission established independently, with independent scrutiny powers, can challenge uh, and comment on whether or not those are appropriate. And clearly, um, you know, if, as Finance Minister, if I was standing up saying, well, here's my forecast and here's the Scottish Fiscal Commission's forecast and they're different, you know, I'll leave that for members to decide how comfortable that's going to be for the Finance Minister. I'm sure Gavin and others would back me 100%. I'm sure, I'm, sure there'd be, I'm sure there'd be a queue of supporters for me in the parliamentary chamber on that, on that particular announcement, but uh, uh, there, there, there we are. Okay, I'm going to open out this, up the session now, and the first person to ask questions will be John, to be followed by Malcolm. Hey, thanks, Convener. Um, probably mainly to expand on some of the points that have been uh, raised already. I, I mean, the point about data availability has been raised that and I think you made the point yourself and Audit Scotland made it as well, that uh, in some cases there just is no data there on a particular question uh, like Scottish taxpayers. In other areas there may be data within HMRC or whatever, and it's, uh, but it's just not available to most of us and, and would presumably take some time for the new body to, to get access to it. I mean, how do you see this by way of time scale that it, it will take a while to get up and running? And I mean, some things will be starting from scratch like Scottish income tax, other things, maybe they can get the information like landfill tax going back a bit in order to help them make forecasts. Will it take a number of years really till this is fully functioning? I, I, I think on the Scottish rate of income tax, the nature of how that power has been um, constructed and um, the, the, it, it will take time for those estimates to to settle down, and that's in the nature of the way in which the, um, the the power has been legislated for by the United Kingdom government. Um, essentially, has a, a period of um, of uh, um, transition, period. transition period is the word I'm looking for. Thank you, um, which essentially 
means there's no there's no gain, there's no loss as we work our way through that. And I, I think that's that's uh, I think that essentially is the practical recognition of the fact that there will be time required to ensure that that uh, power can be properly and effectively forecast um, uh, within safe margins um, for then the Scottish Government to be responsible for that aspect of, 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 of income tax. Um, in relation to um, stamp duty land tax or land and building transaction tax as it now is and landfill tax, uh, I'm very confident that we have um, the data and the material that will enable us as we work through the project with, um, uh, with HMRC to ensure that we're properly equipped to arrive at, uh, at uh, appropriate forecasts of the revenue that will be generated. Now, as with all forecasts, there undoubtedly uh, is, are, can be gaps. You know, we can, they, can buy the, you know, they can be under, they can be over. Um, but that's the nature of the territory we're getting into. But I think we'll, we'll be well equipped for that by the time these taxes are enacted. I mean, if there was a yes vote in the referendum, presumably the remit would have to expand quite rapidly. Um, it, it, would ra it would expand within the, 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 the time scale that the government has set out between the referendum and uh, the autumn of 2014 and uh, the practical implementation of independence in 2016. Yeah. Okay. Um, the, the, going back to the question of appointments, um, I noted your comment that Parliament's sovereign and under the people, I suppose, and um, should be making the kind of final decisions. We discussed this a wee bit with Audit Scotland as well. They, they referred to the OBR, I think three out of five of their board or, or commission or whatever uh, are appointed by government with uh, parliamentary approval. Is your suggestion then that all of the, the members really, it would be better if they were appointed by government with parliamentary approval? Uh, I think instinctively that's where I feel more comfortable. I, 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 I do feel uncomfortable about um, Parliament appointing um, or parliament, parliamentary consent being given to appointments being made by government and then that body having the ability to appoint yet further. Um, I'm just trying to think through in my mind uh, as to the precedence for that. But if I think, for example, of the... Um, you know, public appointments that, that, that I preside over, for example, the Board of Scottish Enterprise. You know, I appoint the chair, but I also appoint the board members. Um, the chair does not have the ability to add on people to the board that he or she sees fit. And I just, it just makes me feel I, I, I can't quite rationalise in my mind how that sits comfortably with the principles that we deploy here in relation to the public appointments process, which is, you know, is generally undertaken on, well, it's undertaken on a basis that um, ministers have certain responsibilities to exercise, uh, to make appointments. Um, in some cases, Parliament exercises those, resp uh, those responsibilities um, where the functions are exclusively for parliamentary scrutiny. Um, but uh, I, I just, I, I think I would take a lot of persuading that giving a power of appointment to uh, a chair that uh, government had nominated and parliament had approved um, was consistent with our approach to appointments. But uh, I'm, not, I'm not wedded to that position. But logic in that, I'm just wondering from a perception point of view, if, if they're all appointed by parliament even, if it will be seen as you know, too close to parliament. And is there any advantage? Do you think there's a, it, it gives a better perception if they can appoint some of their own members? I, I, as I say, Convener, I, I'm, 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 I can see the logic of that argument as well, but it doesn't sit comfortably with me. I, I, I'm a, you know, I, 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 I know I may not always um, be accused of this by um, some of my um, uh, opponents, but fellow members. But at, at heart, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a very clear, par devoted parliamentarian, and I just find it uncomfortable that we are passing off responsibility to another body to undertake that responsibility, which I think is, you know, is, is clearly within our scope and competence. Um, the, a, a, a phrase that um, Audit Scotland used a number of times was the kind of mass, critical mass of work that, you know, to start with, I think we're agreeing that we start small and kind of grow. Um, is your feeling that there is the critical mass of work there to attract 
people of sufficient calibre uh, onto the, the body and um, are there actually enough people out there? Because we've heard from some other small countries that, you know, actually there's not that many experts of this kind of level uh, to have sitting on, on the boards of these bodies. The, uh, I, well, the short answer is yes. I'm, I'm absolutely confident about that because there's, there's numerous individuals within Scotland who've got the knowledge, the capability and the expertise to participate in this activity. And equally, we shouldn't be... Um, you know, we shouldn't be averse to uh, appointments from outside Scotland. Um, why not? That's going to give uh, an element of external challenge to some of these issues, and providing people are sufficiently conversant with the issues and the, uh, the, the detail and the information that's involved, we shouldn't in any way be averse to that. And the appointments process should properly take that into account in determining are people sufficiently ex um, experienced and have sufficient capacity and capability to add meaningfully to this process. So I, I'm, I'm very confident about that point. And I think uh, this, is a, there's a, th this is a new area of activity. So people are always attracted to new areas of activity and involvement. And uh, I think there'll be great interest in this. Thanks very much. OK, thank you. Mark Hunt, you followed by Gavin. You, you expressed concern about uh, the new body intruding on other bodies. I mean, I asked um, Audit Scotland about the relationship between the new body and themselves, and they certainly felt there was a clear demarcation there. So I don't think, according to Audit Scotland, I don't think they would be, the new body would intrude on Audit Scotland. So what other bodies did you have in mind? I think the, I think the question, my answer to that question, convener, was driven by um, my desire to be very clear with the committee about what I think is it within scope for the remit of the Scottish Fiscal Commission. And if we give the Scottish Fiscal Commission um, too broad a remit beyond the forecasting of the taxes that are being uh, devolved to Scotland as a consequence of the Scotland Act 2012, then we create the opportunity for the intrusion into the responsibilities of other bodies. And I'm simply saying that what will be uppermost in my mind will be to avoid a situation that we create the conditions where the body um, has the ability to move into territory that is properly the responsibility of, um, of uh, other organisations that we all accept um, have been properly constituted as part of this process. And could you give an example of what that might involve? Uh, well, the, 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 if, the, if the body, for example, was uh, allowed to consider um, the suggestions about policy choices and the evo evaluation of policy choices, then I think it's intruding in the role of Parliament. Okay. Um, well, I mean, I think that that's really quite helpful because, I mean, obviously you're open-minded and that's what you said at the beginning, but, I mean, I think we are getting a kind of quite a clear steer from you today, which, well, I'll summarise in this way, and you can correct me if you wish, but I mean, I, th I think you envisage the body probably commenting on government forecasts and therefore probably being quite a small body with a limited remit to begin with, but it might potentially have a bigger remit following constitutional developments. But, but in the light of your last comment about uh, policy choices and intruding on other bodies, I mean, presumably you would, in principle, have a concern about your wider remit for this body, even if Scotland's sake it became independent, because the same principle would apply. That's absolutely correct, yes. So, and, and also, uh, for, for, for the record, I think Mr mm -hmm. Chisholm fairly sums up where my mind is on a number of these questions. But, uh, I, 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 but the issues about the development of the body in relation to um, the... Um, the, the question of policy choices, for example, um, if Scotland were to be an independent country, my view would be entirely the same. So, so in terms of some of the evidence we've received about the wider remit, you obviously wouldn't be happy about the kind of uh, Swedish uh, model where they're commenting and recommending improvements to uh, current fiscal policies. But what, for example, uh, well, well, we'll take two examples, but we'll just take one at a time. Uh, Professor David Bell, whom you will know well, suggesting a possible role in considering distributional impacts of budgetary decisions and assessing the environmental impact statement and equality statement, would that be ruled out as, intr as intruding on...? I, I think that's proper territory for Parliament to be holding the government to account for, the, um, uh, for, for both of these areas of policy. 
And another interesting example that came up today in our questioning of Audit Scotland was whether the body might have a role in costing major legislative proposals. I suppose that could be modified in terms of commenting on financial memorandums um, by analogy with commenting on government forecasts. Would that be a possible role or would you have concerns so, about that? Another area where I think you know, the, the arrangements are properly in place just now where Parliament scrutinises the financial memorandums that are put forward. And, you know, from, 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 from my perspective, I, I, I've seen certain financial memorandums been looked at by this uh, distinguished committee um, uh, with uh, wry observation, uh, if I could put it as gently as that. So uh, I don't think there's any lack of scrutiny of financial memorandums that are brought forward. Well, I mean, I mean, it is very interesting, the evidence that you've given. So, so, so it actually sounds as if, in principle, you want quite a narrow remit for this body, whatever the constitutional arrangements are. I, 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 I think this is, a, this is a body to provide independent authority to um, forecasts. Now, if the range of elements for which we have to forecast expands significantly, then clearly the responsibilities of the body expand to deal with that. Um, but in terms of... So, so essentially, at heart, I see the Scottish Fiscal Commission being a body that's commenting on, um, uh, on uh, forecasts that are relevant for the public finances um, in relation to the raising of taxes. Um, and uh, if, our, if our responsibilities expand as a, as a consequence of the referendum in September, then in that spirit, the responsibilities of the Commission will expand into the bargain. And what, and what would be your concerns about the OBR model, which in a kind of way is narrow, but they are actually doing the forecasts? I, I, I think my, my sense of this is that um, the, the, the government will be doing these forecasts anyway. You know, we'd have to. We can't, you know, the government can't just sit there and say, well, we'll just sit here and wait to see what we get from the OBR. It's just, it just doesn't work like that. We'll be doing the forecasts anyway. Um, and um, we will be... Uh, I, I therefore think it is a bit of a... Well, I, I, I don't think, it's a, I don't think it, it actually adds to the confidence that the public can have in this whole mechanism that it is suggested that somehow a body outside of government is actually doing the forecast, is actually um, adding value to the crunching of the numbers when in fact the numbers have been crunched by government itself. I, I just don't think that enhances the perception of the, the whole enterprise. So in a kind of way you're, you're, you're kind of taking a lot of any potential controversy, well not all, but most of the potential controversy out of the remit because when Caroline Gardner was talking about this she said well the wider the remit the more you're potentially intruding on political areas. So you're kind of rejecting that. So it would, in that sense, be more of a, a technical and, as far as it's possible, objective group. So I suppose relating that to the questions about appointments, could you not say that because it is going to have such a narrow remit in your mind and really it's technical, economic and financial expertise that would be required, does that not suggest that it may be possible to have a different appointment process? Because the whole point about the way you appoint Scottish Enterprise and these bodies is that they actually are accountable to you uh, and in some kind of way you actually have oversight and in, in, in a loose sense control, control of them, whereas your relationship with this body is not going to be like that. So should that not mean that there is a different appointment process? Well, I, I am envisaging a different appointment process here because uh, to take the contrast with the Scottish Enterprise model, um, I appoint the chair and the members of the board of Scottish Enterprise without... Um, I notify Parliament, but I don't seek parliamentary endorsement in, in, in any shape or form for that. That's what I'm entitled to do under the Enterprise and Newtown Scotland Act. Um, whereas in, in this model, uh, clearly a different appointment process is going to be taken forward because, at the very least, um, uh, uh, you know, if there's people being, being appointed to this body... Um, I cannot see how they can be appointed to the body um, and its independence protected without the consent of Parliament in some way, whether it's through uh, the, an interaction with the Finance Committee or by parliamentary resolution. OK, that's very interesting, all of it. Thank you. Thank you. Gavin, to followed by Jean. Thanks, Commissioner. Um, Cabinet Secretary, the 
Fiscal Commission Working Group in their report said um, scrutiny could also be extended to include forecasts of existing devolved taxes, uh, council tax and non-domestic rates. What is the Scottish Government response um, to that suggestion? Um, on council tax, uh, the Scottish Government does not forecast council tax as properly a matter for individual local authorities, so I would be, um, I would be reluctant, well, not reluctant, I would be hostile to uh, the, the, a fiscal commission uh, getting into that territory because it would be intruding on the proper responsibilities of local government and I have no desire to do that. Um, on non-domestic rates, um, it's a, you know, I'm, I'm certainly open to considering um, this question. Um, the, the, the forecasting of non-domestic rates is a combination of um, assessments that are made at local authority level and analysis that's undertaken by uh, ministers and ultimately, uh, sorry, by civil servants and decisions are taken by ministers on the degree to which we can uh, utilise the forecasts that have been brought forward. So I, I'm certainly open to considering whether there's a, a role to be undertaken on non-domestic rates, but not in relation to the council tax. Thank you. Um, can you just tell the committee, a, just expand a little bit on the, how you see the timetable working out? Because I think you've said on the record, or in a letter to this committee, um, you obviously want things to be up and running in advance of April 2015. You would envisage um, an independent assessment available to this committee um, each autumn, starting with bud draft budget 1516, which would obviously, uh, I guess, mean autumn of this year. What, what's your sort of? Does the government have a timetable at the moment for when you would appoint people, when the um, the commission would begin its work, as it were? Um, and how long do you think they would need in order to publish um, an assessment um, for that, uh, you know, for that timetable? Well, es essentially, I'm waiting for the outcome of this committee's inquiry. I thought it would have been uh, utterly disrespectful of me to have proceeded to decisions without waiting for this committee to conclude its, its proceedings. So, once the committee's report is to hand, I will move very swiftly to appoint a commission and to establish the remit and the basis of proceeding and obviously in that respect I would need quite a, a, a quick interaction with the committee um, about the response that uh, I've given so the, the normal protocols of however many weeks I have to respond and all the to and fro that goes with it I suspect that's going to have to um, go by the wayside this time around it's going to have to be done um, a great deal uh, swifter um, in terms of the um, the establishment of a remit and the appointment of members to take that forward. Um, and I would be looking to um, essentially establish that basis on what, and I don't know if this is the right term, but I shall use it anyway, a sort of quasi-statutory basis, the basis upon which we establish the committee, the, the commission now in the short term would be the basis upon which I would intend to come back to do so on a statutory basis when the opportunity arises. Uh, to enable the Commission to, to be in place and to be in a position to provide me with the, uh, the forecasts that are required to underpin the budget and to fulfil my commitments to Parliament in relation to um, those elements of the, the written agreement that we've been discussing um, as to how it might be amended to take into account this new responsibility. So just if I got that correctly, there wouldn't be primary legislation to set up the body initially, but your, your, your idea would be you get the principle set up and later on there would, ultimately there would be primary legislation, but not to be, yeah. in advance of this yeah. first. Uh, this we first just, you know, what, what I want to do is to have the, um, the arrangements in place as if we had legislation to enable the functions to be carried out for the 15-16 budget. There is just no physical way in which the legislation can be put through Parliament to, uh, because it would have to be primary legislation. Um, but uh, we will. But my approach would be essentially to work with the committee to come to an agreed um, way of proceeding, um, if that was the committee's desire to do so, um, and then to follow it up by primary legislation in due course. And just finally, obviously, 
a number of stakeholders have given evidence to this committee, both in terms of written submissions uh, and uh, oral submissions. Is, is there, given the, the, the likely swift timetable, I mean, is, is there a way for stakeholders to contribute directly to government? I mean, is there a sort of consultation of some sort? How, how are stakeholders feeding in directly to government in this, if, if indeed they are? The, um, it's obviously been a, a, a certain amount of input that came in through the Fiscal Commission Working Group, which you know we've looked at and considered. Um, we've obviously been looking very closely at the material that's been submitted to the committee in this respect. Um, and I've obviously been discussing with my officials uh, my emerging thinking on this point. I've not undertaken a, um, a specific consultation um, a, in terms of the normal process of inviting contributions, but my officials have been speaking to a range of interested um, experts on this subject to ensure that uh, our views are able to be informed by their input in addition to what the committee has been considering. Yeah. Uh, Jean, uh, Jean, sorry, to be followed by Dave. Uh, thank you, Convener. I think my, my questions uh, have probably been answered in the last, well, the last two questioners. Um, but I, I just wonder if it, it feels as though we've, we've it, from some of the evidence we've had and the, the presentations that have been made, that actually there's, there's a, a rather reduced uh, remit, certainly in the first instance for this uh, new group. And just to ask you, uh, Cabinet Secretary, the, the, I hear what you say about the OBR and its closeness or its apparent closeness to, to government and your anxiety to make that uh, quite different. Are there other um, areas in the remit of the OBR that you would seek to change in the remit um, for the SFC? What I, the first thing that I'd, I'd want to say is I, I, I don't want, um, the, the word I would use to describe my view of the remit of the Fiscal Commission is that I want it to be focused. I don't, it's not, limited is not a word I would use about it. I, I want it to fulfil a specific purpose, which is to uh, comment on the forecasting of tax revenues. Um, there's loads of other bodies do loads of other analysis about all other aspects of public finances. And what I don't want to create is a new body that duplicates or replicates or gets into competition with other bodies. This is a new function that has to be undertaken, and I want it to be undertaken in a very focused way in the forecasting of tax revenues. Um, and that really will drive my thinking about the remit of the body and um, what goes into that remit. Because if I, if I define a remit which is broad in scope, then you know, I'm just opening up for myself the opportunity for this body to do exactly what I'm setting out to the committee. I don't want it to do. I want it to be focused on the forecasting activity. Before by Michael. Uh, thank you, Convener, uh, and morning, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, just to go back to a point that was raised by John Mason uh, earlier on, um, I just wonder, uh, when you were talking about the appointment of the, the board to the Scottish Fiscal Commission, do you envisage that that, that would be subject to the, the normal standard rules for public appointments that are overseen by the Commissioner for Ethical Standards. There are set procedures there, you know, and recommendations are made. There's anonymity. There's a procedure to make sure there's a broad range of people can get onto public bodies and so on. I just wonder, would you envisage it would be subject to those those rules? I, I, I think I'd, I'd want to reserve my position on that point, to Convener, because I think the point that Mr. Thompson raises is um, is is a very important one about the guaranteeing that a proper independent process has been undertaken. But I think it's, it just strikes me as being rather difficult to be able to proceed through an awful lot of the scrutiny of potential applicants for this, for membership of the Commission on the basis of anonymity. Because, you know, it's not, this is not something that, the type of forecasting work that's involved here, 
and been able to comment. Let, let's say that we go for the model where the government produces the estimates and the Commission is scrutinising those forecasts. With the greatest of respect, not everybody can do that, um, that, that type of challenging work. So we would need to have a, you know, it, it may be that we are searching for people with particular expertise in tax forecasting, and you, know, you can't sort of do that on an anonymous basis. So I think I'd want to reserve my position on that point without in any way undermining the importance of um, an independent and transparent process being undertaken to, to complete these appointments. Yeah, yeah, I, mean, I, I, I take what you're saying, and, and, and you're absolutely right. There would be a restricted number, and uh, it may well be that the anonymity wouldn't be anonymity at all, because uh, names and things not being there, uh, you know, the, 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 the folk sort of looking for these appointments would probably know, as they know they do in, in some cases already for, for other public appointments. It's just really that this is an extremely important body and to be absolutely clear and, 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 and transparent and so on, it just strikes me that, you know, that the, the Ethical Standards Commission does have a role possibly here. Well, certainly, I, I certainly, it would be, it, it's a very helpful point to have been raised and um, as part of my thinking, um, I, I, one of the commitments I'll give to the committee today is before I uh, come to conclusions, I will consult uh, the Commissioner uh, on these issues to, uh, to determine his, uh, his view on these questions. Thank you. Thank you. Michael. Uh, thanks, Convener. Just to, to get clarification on an issue that I've been pursuing uh, through all of the evidence that we've been taking, I think you've, you've more or less uh, indicated what your thinking is. Cabinet Secretary has been very clear in that this morning, but some of the evidence is between allowing the, the fiscal body to not just analyse and project, but also to suggest um, policy direction. And I think you're indicating that you would prefer not to see that. But the Auditor General this morning said that while clearly she would not want to see that initially, it might be something that could be left open into the longer term as, as the, the Commission developed. Are you ruling that out? I, I would rule that out, Mr. McMahon. I, 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 yeah, I think these issues are the proper preserve of members of Parliament. Thanks very much, Vivian. Okay, thank you very much to colleagues around the table. That's concluded their questions. I've just got a couple of further questions, uh, um, uh, Cabinet Secretary. First one is, um, in terms of distinguishing from the appointment of members of the Commission, should the Commission itself have the ability to appoint its own members of staff that would support the Commission members? Oh, uh, yes, yes, yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. And just one other uh, question. Uh, in terms of the, the Fiscal Commission Working Group's report, uh, Fiscal Rules and uh, Fiscal Commissions, uh, on, on page 11, um, under the section headed Fiscal Commission, the recommendation is that, and I quote, the Scottish Fiscal Commission should assess Scotland's long-term fiscal position and the Scottish Government's adherence to its fiscal rules. Would that be one of the roles of the, the new body? That's, a, that's a, 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 a scenario which essentially... Um, is uh, argued for by the Fiscal Commission um, in connection with Scotland being an independent country, and that's the type of um, that's the type of assessment which I think would be appropriate for a Fiscal Commission to undertake, um, whether to be a yes vote in a referendum. Thank you very much for that, um, Cabinet Secretary. Do you have any further points you want to make to the committee uh, I, at this I'm stage? My points, can we have okay. Well, thank you very much, actually, for such clear and concise uh, answers to your questions uh, today. That being the last item on our agenda, that concludes uh, this week's committee.